Okay, tonight we're going to be looking at the, uh, the consequences of sin. And so when, uh, when we do sin, when there is uh, sin within our life, we looked at how it got here, we looked at how it continues, we looked at how the church is to respond, uh, but how, what, what, does it, what does it mean to, uh, to have order and morality given by a holy and a righteous God and to have people disobey that order and that morality? What are the consequences of that? What are the, the actions on God's part? And we're going to look at the, the physical response of, of God within our, our lives as we live, and we're also going to look at the spiritual response of God and the, uh, the eternal implications to, uh, to sinfulness and uh, our need for, uh, for forgiveness and our need to be redeemed. Um, for those who realize that and accept it and ask for it, and those who don't. And so as we start off our, our conversation, let me just ask, why, uh, why would there be consequences for sin? And when I, when I ask that, I think we, we probably tend to, uh, to think about you know, why we, we ourselves as, as parents or, or you know, authority figures or whatever it may be, why we, have, why we create consequences. Because if there is, uh, you see this, you see this uh, sometimes where uh, a parent, for instance, um, if you have children or grandchildren, nieces, nephews who are involved with extracurricular stuff, whether it's sports or, um, you know, dance or, uh, you know, singing or whatever it might be, you will, you will probably run into someone who uh, the, the, the parent, uh, the child is doing something, you know, just walking to Walmart, uh, you know, the child is doing something and the parent says, you know, come here, stop doing that, uh, whatever it may be. And there is a realization in that child's face that there are absolutely no consequences for whatever I do. Uh, you know what I mean? And so there's, there's the, you do this or else. And the child realizes or else isn't coming. You know, or else is not going to happen. And so, with with God, we have this this morality, and we have the the commands of the Lord, and uh, He has He has ordered life and grace and and the sacrifice in such a way that uh, that there is opportunity to be forgiven for the sinfulness that we commit. And yet, if we don't accept that opportunity, there will be consequences, and not like the mom or the dad in Walmart. These are real consequences, and so why would a merciful, loving, gracious God give consequences? What's, because what's, he is a loving God, and as a Christian, he loves us so much if there were not consequences of what we do, then as humans, we probably wouldn't change. But I know when I sin, I don't have peace mm -hmm. until I ask God for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. but see, that's what's so amazing about him. Yeah. It's because it's another mm -hmm. form of teaching us and pulling him closer to us. Yeah. I mean to him. Yeah. So I'm gonna change your language just a little I'm bit. Sorry. So you know you so you have corrective consequences. You, yes. you have to to help us correct we're we're on we're on the wrong path. Right. And we need to to have someone correct us and put us back on the the right path. So right. it's a discipline type thing. It's yes. it's corrective to get us going in the right direction. Absolutely. What's what's another reason for for consequences? Well, what she was saying as far as the closeness yeah. So it's it's not only corrected to get us back in line with His standard of morality, but it's also to correct and bring us back into fellowship with God. Sure. Very good. All right. What else? God is holy. holy. We could be using us as examples of what not to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we could. Yeah. So if He's holy, you should be holy. then He wants us to be holy. Yeah. So I'll I'll get us back into to fellowship. What else? All right, I see I use the word gracious, loving, holy, 
uh, righteous. There's one word that I haven't used. Mm -hmm. Who said it? Mallory? Yes. All right. So <laughs> I have some confidence. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So one of the reasons that there are consequences is because God is just. This is the this is the the basis. We think about we think about God's grace and think about God's mercy as the the, the foundation, the basis as to why he sent Jesus to die in our place. But it's not. Justice is the reason that God sent Jesus to die in our place. Because if it was just about grace and mercy, then he would have just said, you're all forgiven. But that would not be just. That would not be fair. And so something had to suffer and to die for the consequences of sin. And instead of requiring that of us, the Lord put that on himself. And so justice is the foundation of the cross. It's why something had to die for the penalty of our sin. And so as we look at the consequences of sin, the, the reason that they still exist, even with the sacrifice of Christ, is because if we have not accepted that, then as, as gracious and loving, as merciful as God is, that does not trump the fact that God is a just God. He is going to be fair. He is going to, to do what is right, no matter how much he loves us and wants us to be, to be saved. It, it, it's going to be fair. And so uh, looking at the, and, and again, we, we uh, get the benefits of, of that fairness, so to speak, in that it's, it's not fair that we get to be in fellowship with him, but the Lord knew that, and so in order to make that right, he took that, he took that penalty on himself. And so let's look at the consequences of sin. Uh, like any mistake that's made, uh, the commission of sin comes with consequences and repercussions. Things are going to happen because we have disobeyed God. Uh, these consequences come most severely spiritual in our receiving either eternal life or eternal death, uh, but also are seen within the, our physical lives as well. And this is what we're going to look at first. And so let's look first at the physical consequences of sin. Let's think of what Sally said when we're looking at getting us back on the right path. Uh, Miller Erickson describes the most immediate result of sin being God's divine disfavor often classifies those who sin as enemies of God. And so this is seen both with unbelievers and those who claim to be servants of God. Twice in the Old Testament, God is said to hate Israel because of their sin, one in Hosea 9, the other in Jeremiah chapter 12. And so it is not just the, the divine disfavor in the sense that, look, I don't like what you guys are doing and you need to fix it. No, the, the very core of who they are is sinfully disobedient. And, and the Lord cannot, uh, cannot accept that sinfulness even by the people of God. And so this divine disfavor leads to divine difficulties in the life of the, the person, the people group, or the nation. Let's look at a couple of biblical examples here. Now, the first one we see is, is the one we've been looking at for the last seven weeks, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, you know, we sin, and immediately there, is, there are consequences for that. Uh, there is an impact that is seen within our life, and, and this is because we have, uh, again, uh, gone against God. And so... What is the reason that we have all of these, these things happen within Genesis chapter 3? There's a whole lot, but, uh, but one of them for sure, as we think about struggles over authority, as we think about pain, as we think about all these different things, is to, to help us to realize that we are on the wrong path and we need to get back right in our relationship with God. And so this is, you know, we think of our, our struggles and our toils as just, uh, uh, you know, man, this is, uh, this is awful. I, I just want to be on a beach somewhere and not a care in the world. I don't want to have to be going through, through all of this. But it's the struggles that help remind us, hey, this is not how things are supposed to be. And, and it's not how things are, are supposed to be, not because God hates us or, or wants difficulty on us or whatever it may be, but it's because we have sinned against a holy and a righteous God, and this is the, the result of that. 
Uh, Genesis chapter 34 and 35, we see uh, Reuben was refused his birthright because of his sin against Jacob. And Simeon and Levi were refused because of their aggression in Seshem, uh, thus passing to Judah as the patriarch after Jacob. And so, um, you know, this is a very uh, tangible, real world uh, type of thing to happen. Whereas, unlike you see with Jacob and Esau, where there is, you know, there's, there's certainly some, some um, conniving, I guess you'd say, with, within humanity. But with Jacob and Esau, and then with the sons of Joseph as well, there's, there's a divine reason why these, these birthrights are changed, so to speak. There's a, there's, a, there's a plan that God has in place that isn't exactly in line with the heritage or to the tradition of the time. Well, with Reuben and Simeon and Levi, you could also say this, but, but the reasons that are given here at the end of the book of Genesis is we see Reuben's sin, and we see Simeon and Levi's aggression, and we see all these things that, that God looks and he says, because you have done this, uh, this is now going to, to pass, and Judah is going to be the, uh, the one who sort of continue as they all, the 12 tribes certainly continue the, the work of the, the lineage and the, the people of God, but Judah is the one who we're going to see all of these, these things come from. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, chapter 34, Numbers 14, Deuteronomy 5, uh, God talks about punishing the third and fourth generation for the iniquity of the fathers of the previous generation. Boy, if this doesn't scare you a little bit, um, just at, at the, the way in which sin doesn't just bear consequences for you, uh, but also for your children and your descendants. And there's a couple of ways of, of looking at this, this particular passage. Um, there is, you know, you can, you can sort of classify in two different ways. You, you can think about it as, you know, divine consequences versus divinely uh, uh, pre-seen pragmatic consequences. And however you want to look at it, I, I think you definitely see some of the, the practical aspects of it in this is that because of your sinfulness, the Lord is going to visit iniquity to the third and fourth generation because they're going to learn from your practices. They're going to learn from the sinfulness and the disobedience that you have. Um, you know, I don't know who the, the, the actual quote is attributed to, but um, I think we probably all heard it. What uh, one generation tolerates, the next generation accepts. And you certainly see this in the, the progression of sin. What, what starts to gain momentum and one generation is, is outright full-blown accepted in the next. And so when you look at that, you start to see how sinfulness and the consequences of sin can be seen in the third and the fourth generation because we're constantly learning from those who were before us. If they're obedient, then we learn to be obedient. If they're disobedient, we learn to be disobedient. So I think that there is a divine aspect to it because this is this is the way in which God is is saying, but there's also a pragmatic uh, part to it as well. All right, Second Samuel chapter twelve, because of David's sin uh, with Bathsheba, the Lord actually takes the life of his son, and this is this is Nathan actually you know Nathan actually tells him um, this is why the Lord's doing this because of your sin the Lord is going to take the life of your son, and. David doesn't want this, Bathsheba doesn't want this, but it's, it's sinfulness and it's a result of that sinfulness. Uh, Psalm 94, blessed is the man whom the Lord disciplines. There you go, Sally. You know, it is, it is the, um, the way in which God helps us to get back in line with, with correct morality. Sometimes we just need, we need a little nudge and sometimes we need to be pushed and sometimes we need to be punched. I mean, it just, it, depending on what we're doing and how far off course we are, uh, we will have the Lord's discipline. Uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, God, gives, God gives us up to our spiritual passions and the resulting harm within, the, you know, within Romans chapter 1 right here. Um, it not only uh, talks about, well, to start with, it's the only example of female homosexuality in the entire Bible. And so that's, that's the only place that you see it. Every other instance of uh, Arsenio coitus, which it is in the Greek, is actually the masculine form. This is the only place where it's in the feminine form. 
but uh, it also talks about the resulting harm that comes from this disobedience to God's ordered standard morality. And, you know, that's, that's not just a, a spiritual harm that is, is talking about there. It's also a physical harm as well. Uh, Acts chapter 5 uh, God slays Ananias and Sapphira for a malicious misuse of the truth. I use this uh, even within my, my ethics classes as I'm talking about lying. Because what is the difference between uh, Ananias and Sapphira and other people throughout the Bible and the Hebrew midwives who they're coming, hey, you know, did, you, did they give birth to any boys? No, we don't know what's happening to them. They're going off in the field and they're having babies and, you know, they don't, they don't need us. You know, what's, what's the difference uh, between what they did and the Hebrew midwives? It was a malicious misuse of the truth. It was, it was for personal gain. It was for something um, that they are lying for something that is against God's glory rather than, than you know, having, having a, a statement that may not be true, but it's not true because you're trying to sin against God and I'm trying to, uh, to protect people. Now, at the same time, we have to be real careful with that. Because we can always justify a little white lie, can we not? Um, we can always make out some way where, you know, this might this might help me out a little bit, but I'm going to use it for God's glory. Uh, so I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to have a little bit of uh, mistruth here. So we have to be very very careful with this. But again, there is a difference between a malicious misuse of the, misuse of the truth and trying to protect life, trying to to do something for God's glory. Um, because by definition, they both lied, but one of them is rewarded and one of them is punished. Uh, Acts chapter, oh, that's Acts chapter, Revelation 21. Um, this is a, one of the passages that I often read at funerals, at some place in the funeral. But um, Revelation 21 actually lists five physical consequences of sin that will be redeemed by God. And so the first one is we see tears and crying. There will be no more tears and there will be no more crying. And so if God has to redeem this and God has to correct this, uh, this means that this is something that was brought on by sin. And, and so every, every tear we, we cry, uh, that is a result of sinfulness on, on the earth. Death, of course, is mentioned. Death was, uh, you know, Genesis chapter 3, one of the most uh, severe effects of phys or physical effects of sin within our life. Mourning of any kind. Um, and this is not just, you know, we think of mourning predominantly as loss, sorrow. We're mourning somebody who, who's passed away. But we can mourn people in their decisions, you know, what they're doing. Well, we, can, uh, we can just mourn in the fact that we know uh, they are not on the path that, that God wants for them. And we're praying so desperately that... They will be, but there's nothing we can do about it. That's an individual decision. They have to make an individual relationship they have to have with God. And so, yes, we, we mourn that. Um, we mourn that for them. Uh, physical pain is a result of sin. That's going to be no more uh, once, once God redeems this, uh, these consequences that we, we have. And then punishment in general. Uh, this comes in both divine and legal forms. Um, sin is a, is a selfish wrongdoing, and without sin, there would be no need for punishment. There would be no need for uh, corrective behavior. But because there is, punishment also exists. And so uh, these things, just within uh, Revelation 21, show some of the immediate consequences Again, not just the, the, the way in which things happen because of sin, because, but God has looked on us, seen our sin, and said, because of that, these are the, con the consequences, and these are things that everyone is going to have to endure. The, the best of the best, the most righteous, are still, is still going to experience sorrow in which they cry. They're still going to experience loss or, or something in which they mourn. We're all going to experience physical pain. So all of these are... are uh, things that we have to deal with as uh, a consequence from, from the Lord uh, with sin. Okay, physical effects of sin on the sinner. Uh, sin has at least the following impact on our lives and relationships. And so because of sinfulness, there is the consequence of alienation. 
this is not just alienation from each other, but it's also, as Hunter was pointing out, alienation from God, separation from God, a desire for us to be closer to the Lord, and we're just not in that fellowship. Uh, there have been times, and I, I would imagine all of our lives, but I'll just speak from my own experience, uh, there have been times where I have felt further away from God, and there have been times where I felt closer to God. Um, there have been times where sinfulness was more at the forefront of my mind and God was more at the back of my mind and times where that's been flipped. And so one of the consequences is we are alienated from God and in at least a small sense physically, uh, but as we get down to the, the spiritual consequences, we can also be permanently alienated from God spiritually if we're not careful. Disharmony. Is this not Satan's goal for sin? It's just disharmony, period. Uh, disharmony between us and God. Disharmony with us and each other. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's written on a, uh, I'm not going to say a child's level, but it's certainly to a point where children could read it. But uh, C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters is an excellent uh, peek behind the curtain, so to speak, at the uh, the spiritual warfare and the plans that, that must be, be taking place. We think of the, the Hollywood version and, and all this sort of stuff of spiritual warfare, but in reality it is much more subtle and it is much more calculated and disharmony, sowing seeds of, of conflict among people and sowing uh, seeds of, of just thoughts in our, our mind about God. And, you know, this is the, the work of the enemy. Envy. Without a focus on God, where do we have to put our attention except for what we have compared to what other people have? You know, if, if, we, if, we are, if we're not seeking after the goal of, of glorifying God, then ultimately we're going to be trying to, to worship something because we're created to worship, and so that turns inward, and we think, well, I'm, I need to glorify myself. How can I do that? when my car is not as nice as my neighbor's? How can I do that when my, uh, you know, my house is not as, as nice as my, my neighbor's? How can I do that when my children are not as successful as uh, you know, somebody else's children or whatever it may be? When we don't focus on God, that focus has to, to be directed somewhere else, and we have envy. Progressive corruption. When there, you know, part of, one of the things that we've we've done uh, since January is we kind of rewritten our um, the way in which we use the fellowship fund, and so one of the the things that we ask people to do is as they come in, we talk to them a little bit, and we'll we'll help with the needs. Sometimes we're able to help with the whole needs. Sometimes the the you know the financial matter is just too great, and it would take the entire fund in order to. Uh, to help with that, and so we're only able to help with part of it. But anyway, when they come in and they 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 ask for help, we we help them up to a point. But then before they're able to get help again, they have to come to a, a class that we have every Thursday, every third Thursday, uh, that teaches them a couple of financial principles and things like that. It also teaches them what the church's responsibility is in terms of of helping with financial things because contrary to popular belief, we are not an ATM that people just come to and can take as much money as they, as they would like and we're free to give it. That's not, that's not what the Lord has called us to do. And so uh, this, is, this is one of the things that they, uh, we, we ask them to do because sin is not an isolated instance. Sin is progressive in that you know, as we find ourselves in straying away from the path that God has laid, if we don't follow the, the corrective action, if we don't have somebody come into our life and try and direct us, you know, back on, on to the, the way we're supposed to go, then we tend to drift further and further and further away. You know, nobody, nobody ever started with just the, the you know, you can think of the, the worst of the worst, center that you can think of or the worst of the worst center in you know history or whatever it may be nobody started with that you know it 
it progressed and, and we have this corruption that gets bigger and then a little bit bigger and then a little bit bigger until the point where we find ourselves at, at that point that we're at. And so as a result of, of the consequences of sin, you can go back to, to Romans chapter 1, as we find ourselves off the path and as we uh, God tries to correct us if we refuse that, then as Romans 1 says, then God will give us up to that debased mind. God will give us up to that sin. Um, God will use us in the same way that he used Pharaoh, in the sense that if you will not turn from your wickedness, then I'm going to harden your heart and make you even more wicked so that even more glory will be given to me. This is what happens with the Lord. But it doesn't, all, it doesn't just start with that one thing. It is a progressive corruption. Uh, enslavement to sin. Uh, what some people consider freedom from sin, as we, we look at that statement within the Bible, when we look at that understanding, what some people, when, when you say freedom from sin, uh, some people take that as freedom to sin. And uh, they will say to themselves, you know, because I am not under the penalty of the law, because I know I have the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, I can just go out and say, Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do, because I know I'm going to do it, and I know it's sinful, but I know you're going to forgive me. So here we go. What that actually is, that's not freedom from sin. That's the very definition of being enslaved by sin, by just by by realizing that it's got such a tight hold on us that we can know that this does not please God, and yet we're going to do it anyway because it's, it's, it's not something that we can break on our own. It's actually a, a wake-up call that, hey, maybe we, are not, maybe we are not in relationship with Christ in the way that we think we are. If we know that he's not pleased at what we're doing, and we know that beforehand, and yet we're going to do it anyway. That's, a, that's the very definition of being a slave to sin. Going along with that, we have self-centeredness. I mean, all sin is ultimately selfishness. We, des we, we think of our desires as more important than other people's desires. Think about our desires as even more important than God's desires for our life. So it all really comes down to selfishness. Uh, delusional thinking, uh, whether it is Romans 1 or whether it is uh, 2 Timothy 4 where uh, Paul tells Timothy, you know, there's going to be a day where people have itching ears and they're just going to go find a teacher that will tell them whatever they want to hear. Um, it's, it's delusional thinking. We are fooling ourselves into thinking that, you know, oh, if I can just find anybody, you know, they, it, it doesn't matter who they are. They could be a you know, a drug addict Monday through Saturday, but if you're in the pulpit Sunday telling me what I want to hear, then that's, that's, that's from God. That's, that's exactly what I need to, to be doing. It's, it's, it's a false sense of reality to think that there are no consequences of sin because the Lord loves us and is merciful. And when we just forget that whole concept of justice and we just lean so much on the fact that that I'm going to do what I want to do, and it's my selfishness, it's my delusional thinking, it's my um, self-centeredness, it's, it's all of it together. These effects of sin are something that every member of humanity must carry with them uh, throughout their physical life. This is why the, all, the Bible often uses the metaphor of sin as a stain, uh, First, or James chapter 1, for instance, or as a weight, uh, something that is a burden to us and must ultimately be removed by God. Because this is what sin is. It's something that we cannot overcome on our own. It has to be. We have to have the help of God. Otherwise, we're just going to be enslaved to it. And part of that help from God is, you know, I, I love the, it's kind of sarcastic, so I, I like it. But um, uh, I, the, uh, there's, this, there's this thing that's been going around for years now where it's this cartoon. It's a cartoon little character. And uh, he's on his knees, and he's got his hands, and he's clearly praying and he's looking up and he says Lord please speak to me uh, I, you know I want to I want to hear from you and there's a big old hand reaching out from the clouds that has a Bible in it and handing it to the person you know this is this is part of the the delusional thinking believing that you know because 
we we believe you know this much of the bible not not the rest of it but this much where it talks about christ dying for us because he loves us so much and forgiving us forgiving our sins and we don't have anything to worry about because he has justified us without looking at uh, the consequences of sin and the fact that even believers uh, we we need to think about the consequences of sin within our life and that transitions uh, to the spiritual consequences of sin let's look first at uh, spiritual consequences for unbelievers. Um, obviously, we're talking about hell. Uh, we're talking about separation from God here. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, here again, I, I like this, and I, I think I said this when we were doing our series through 1 and 2 Thessalonians. You've got the, the fire and brimstone. You've got the lake of fire. You've got the weeping and gnashing of teeth. You've got all of these descriptions of hell within the Bible. I think 2 Thessalonians 1 sums it up better than anything else when it, because it talks about, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, it talks about the wicked, and it talks about the, 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 the consequences for the wicked. And what it is is eternal destruction. This is back into the, the, you know, the same sort of grouping as the lake of fire and the weeping and gnashing of teeth. But it says eternal destruction away from the presence and the glory of God. This is the real sadness and sorrow of the way in which the Bible describes hell is that it is literally the only place in existence where there is no hope because it is the place in existence where the presence of God is not. And so you, you are resigned to this, for the first time ever, the, the, the place that is absent, the presence and the glory of God. And so I have described it before like this, as, a, as an unbeliever, if you, are, if you are not trusting in the sacrifice of Christ, this world, with all of its struggles and sorrows and pain and mourning and tears and, and all these things, are, if you are an unbeliever, this is life is the closest to heaven you will ever get but if you are a believer here still with the the pain and the sorrow and the mourning and and all of these different things but still with the presence of god and the hope of god this is the closest to hell we're ever going to get thank the lord Amen. yeah and so for for the believer it only gets better for the unbeliever it only gets worse and, and that's where you can really think about life because we can find happiness and joy. We're supposed to find happiness and joy. We've been going over Ecclesiastes where it's given a very realistic uh, view of what life is. But even in all that, Solomon says, find joy in life, find happiness in life. This is the gift that, the, that God has given you. So for us, this is the worst it's going to get. Uh, but for the unbeliever, this is the absolute, with, with all the struggles, this is the best that it's going to get because at least here, even if they don't believe in God, at least they have the hope and the presence of God that exists here around us. You don't have that in hell. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. This is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, and here again, there's three things that this parable points out um, that I think are important for us to, to know. One, that God will help the faithful. You know, Lazarus suffered in his life, uh, but upon his death and, and within his spiritual life, God will help the faithful. Second, the unrepentant will experience irreversible punishment. There's nothing you can do once that, once that event happens. At that point in time, you have either trusted or you can't. Or you, or you haven't, I should say. And number three, through Abraham, the prophets, and Jesus, God reveals himself so that none can protest their eternal faith. If you remember the rich man in the parable, he says, just let me go back and tell my brothers. You know, you know let me tell them, because they're on their own path too, just let me go back and, and let me tell them the, the, the agony that I'm going through and that they need to change their ways. And Abraham says, if they haven't believed me and they haven't believed the prophets, they would not even believe it if the dead were raised and told them to change their ways. And so what this, this particular parable tells us about the eternal consequences of sin for the unbeliever is that God will help the faithful, but once that that happens, it is irreversible. There is no there is no help at that point. There is nothing that can be can be done, and none of us can protest it. 
because we, again, we have Abraham, the prophets, Jesus. We have the word of God. Uh, objections to hell. This is from C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain. Uh, one objection to hell is the, the apparent disproportion between eternal damnation and transitory sin. And so some people will say, well, this is just not fair. Um, Lewis responds that even if there was an extended opportunity for repentance, finality must come at some point, and that the point of finality must be determined by an omniscient God and not humanity. So what this what C.S. Lewis says there is, even if you were to play the, the game of kick the can down the road, just give me a little bit longer, give me a little bit longer, give me a little bit longer, finality has to come at some point. And so if finality has to come at some point, then the, the place that that occurs has to be predetermined by a perfect, omniscient, holy God and not humanity because we would mess it up. We would, we would not be able to do it justly. And so if that's the case, it's really a philosophical point. If that's the case, then the, the point of finality that has been set, again, I'll take you back to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. No one can say they don't deserve their eternal fate. Very quickly, uh, I'm going to go through this super fast. Uh, for believers, we may think that spiritual consequences for believers uh, end when they receive their citizenship in heaven. However, there are two passages I would like us to consider. Uh, one is Mark 10 and Matthew 20. This is James and John asking to be at the uh, one to be at the right hand of Jesus and one to be at the left. You know, does anybody, you Bible scholar out there, anybody know what the difference between Mark 10 and Matthew 20 is within this story? And in one place, it's their mama. Yeah. It's like, hey, here's my two boys here. They've been following you. Let one of them sit at your, your right hand and one of them at your, your left. And even with the mama, Jesus says, no, <laughs> you know, uh, must not have been Mother's Day. You can't turn down a request uh, from mother on Mother's Day. But um, it says, that's not for me to give. It's for whoever that place has been appointed. And so there, there is a, an understanding that there will be places of honor within heaven and there will be you know for lack of a better term i hate i hate saying it this way but here again i'm imperfect um but there will be places of honor and there will be places for ordinary people um you know and so we're all in heaven praise god worshiping all day long 24 7 but there will be places of honor and that is an eternal consequence of our life second one matthew chapter 10 uh right after this uh talks about a prophet's reward versus a righteous person's reward. Uh, again, the, the context here is they're both rewards. They're both great. Uh, but there's somewhat of a difference between a prophet's reward and a righteous person's reward. And what exactly does that mean in, in light of eternity, eternal consequences, so to speak, for, uh, for our, our life? Something, just something to ponder. I don't, I don't have an answer for you uh, this evening, but uh, just, just to, to cook your, your noodle a little bit. Um, and so, uh, look around because somebody in this room may have a place of honor in in heaven. I doubt it, but it could happen. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, questions or comments? Yes. Um, in terms of the well, God decides when we're going to die. Yeah. But someone kills himself. Yeah. Well, um, the Bible never speaks of that directly. Most of our and here again, big issue. Thank you. While we got two minutes left, Pam, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> big issue, and there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways to, of looking at that. The Bible never says directly that someone who kills himself is outside of the grace of God. And, and when I, the understanding comes from the Catholic idea of a mortal sin, where the the act of suicide can, by by its very nature, you're now dead. You cannot ask forgiveness for that sin, and so that's that's the that's the idea of of the mortal sin and the fact that uh, well, if you if you if you take your own life, now you are incapable of asking for forgiveness for that sin. And within the, the Catholic idea, if you don't ask for it, it's not given type thing. Um, 
couple of examples, you know, the only, the very, very few examples we have of suicide in the Bible um, don't exactly paint a pretty picture uh, of it. Um, we got Saul um, getting ready to be, you know, he fears he's going to be uh, violated and made a show of and by the enemy. And so he asks his armor bearer, you know, please kill me. He won't do it. And so he kills himself. Um, we have a couple other examples in uh, the uh, the Old Testament. We've got, um, you know, technically, I mean, it was a, here again, you look at the difference between something like Saul versus Samson. Um, technically he committed suicide, but did it to take everybody else with him, you know, type thing. Um, Judas, I've heard somebody mention Judas in the, um, the, the New Testament. And then you, you also look at degrees. And so uh, the person who's feeling incredibly sorrowful and is, I don't want to go on, commit suicide, uh, that's, that's one way of thinking about it. Secret service agent who jumps in front of a bullet for the president and dies, technically committed suicide um, on behalf of somebody else. The soldier who jumps on a grenade to save his his uh, platoon technically commits suicide. Um, so all of these things together, there's not a clear picture biblically. And this is why I say when you're looking at these type of, of instances, whether it's suicide or whether it's anything else, does this individual have the fruits of the Spirit in their life? Uh, are, they, are they exhibiting uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. So is, is this something, because the, the, the Bible does make clear, if we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, then we will be exhibiting these fruits. And, and that's why it's, it's so important not just to, to profess the word, but also show the word with our life. You take the example of, of Judas, and I'm dead serious, fam. I really don't have an answer for you. Um, in terms of this, other than to say you have to, you have to. I think you have to look at the, the life of the person before the act itself. Because you take Judas, for instance, and commits suicide, betrays Jesus, all these things. But none of this happened just during Passion Week. From the very beginning, you look earlier in the, the Gospel of John, the entire time that, that Judas is serving as a disciple, he's stealing money that's given to Jesus and the other disciples. And so there's a there's a there's a character that's been building up within this person for a number of years. It's not just this passion week where he decides to betray, he regrets it, and now he, he commits suicide. And so that's where we don't get to make that judgment. Only, only the Lord is the one who can judge who is welcomed into the fellowship of God and who's not. But we don't judge somebody based on the worst thing that they've ever done. That would, that would be unfair for us. And so I think you have to look at the whole life of the person. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's a there's a lot of of things that that go into that, um, and it's just not. I don't think you can, here again. My view. I don't think you can look at the worst thing that anybody does and judge their entire life based on that. All right, thank you guys. Let me uh, pray for us, then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done. Thank you for uh, your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you that in your justice, in your your unwillingness to betray what is right, uh, you looked on our sinful state and you didn't uh, force us to undergo that, that penalty, but you took that on yourself. Lord, what a... Uh, what a great God we serve. What an example we have of goodness and mercy. Just help us to, to try and exhibit that in our own lives as best we can. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.